is just a beyond a huge honor today to be podcast interviewing a dental implant legend, Dr. Jerry Nisnek, the founder and president of Corvette Bioengineering and Paragon Dental Implant Company back in 1982 to 2001, which he sold to Zimmer Dental. The screw vent internal hex implant that he invented in 1986 is still the backbone of Zimmer's dental implant system 25 years later. Barron's Magazine article on dental implant industry, February 15, 2005, referred to Dr. Nisnik as a prosthodontist and entrepreneur who is considered by many as the godfather of American dental implant dentistry. He started designing and manufacturing a new line of products in 2004 that were launched in October 2006 through Implant Direct International. In just four years, Implant Direct had a significant global presence in the implant industry with 300 employees sales offices in the United States, Canada, Switzerland, and Israel, and with distributors in over 30 countries. Dr. Nisdik's product and marketing strategy of selling high-quality, innovative products with all-in-one packaging at about a third the price of major implant companies captured about 4% of the global marketing, doubling the sales volume that Corvent Paragon achieved after 20 years. Though Dr. Nisdik's implementation of industries only lights out 24-7 manufacturing and effective use of the internet for technical support and online ordering. He created a price point in the industry, making implant dentistry more affordable for dentists and their patients. In December 2010, Cybron Dental Solutions, a division of Danaher, which is a $15 billion conglomerate, acquired 75% interest in Implant Direct International, leaving Dr. Nizek the president of a joint venture that also included Cybron's Attachment International and Cybron Implant Solutions business assets. Dr. Nisdik graduated from the University of Manitoba Dental School in 1966 and then earned a master's degree in prosthodontics at Indiana University in 1968. Throughout the 80s and 90s, he personally trained over 10,000 dentists worldwide on the placement and restoration of dental implants using lectures and live surgical demonstrations. In the 29 year span between Corvette in 1982 and Implant Direct in 2010, Dr. Nisnik has had 35 dental implant U.S. patents issued to him, including the internal connection patent that has become the cornerstone of modern implant dentistry. His newer patents include ones for microthreads, double trilobe connections, a one-piece with multi-unit abutment platforms, a healing collar retained by the cover screw, and several pending patents, including the GoDirect's one-piece implants and GPS abutment system, both compatible with Zest Anchor Company's locator attachment. Dr. Nisnik's significant contributions to the dental implant field have been recognized by academic institutions and dental implant organizations. He has received honorary doctorate degrees from the University of Manitoba and from Tel Aviv University, as well as the prestigious Isaiah Liu Research Award from the American Academy of Implant Dentistry. He was also awarded Alpha Omega Dental Fraternity's highest award, the Achievement of Medal, in 2007. The United States Department of Veterans Affairs issued a commendation to Dr. Nizdik for conceiving and funding the largest dental implant study worldwide at 32 VA centers that included 900 patients receiving over 2,800 of Dr. Nizdik's implants, special issues of the Journal of Periodontology and the Journal of the Oral and Maxillofacial Surgery were dedicated to publishing the results of this monumental prospective multi-center clinical study, which added significantly to dental implant knowledge my God, Jerry, what a resume. What are you going to do for an encore? I'm exhausted just listening to you. <laughs> um, I, encore, um, I'm in the aerospace industry now. Uh, I've got a, a large manufacturing facility that makes parts for Boeing, Lockheed, Airbus, um, and uh, hotel businesses. So I, I keep myself busy. I'm still uh, a consultant to Implant Direct, but I retired three years ago uh, and have no uh, real involvement other than giving them product advice uh, since then. So uh, I'm enjoying my family, uh, married 52 years, two daughters, six grandchildren, um, drive a Harley, fly an airplane, play golf, just enjoying the good life. So, Jerry, a lot of these uh, young kids coming out of dental school don't realize how pioneering you were and how controversial dental implants were when you started. Correct? I mean, That's for sure. Uh, the the uh, early guys placing dental implants, a lot of dental state boards thought 
that was a crazy idea. A lot of dental schools thought it was a crazy idea. It took years for that to catch on. There were, in, all through the 70s, there was a very small group of us that did implants belonging to the American Academy of Implant Dentistry. Uh, and um, um, uh, I uh, then joined ICOI, which is another fledgling, fledgling um, organization. Uh, but really, we met in hotels, uh, hotel rooms and courses with Lenny Linkow and a few others. Uh, it was an exciting period. But um, by the end of the 70s, I was somewhat disillusioned with the predictability of the results. And I almost quit altogether. Um, and then I decided that if I could just come up with an implant to place two implants in the symphysis to stabilize an overdenture, I would be happy. High benefit, low risk, um, uh, lower dentures never fit well. And uh, I focused my attention on developing that implant and an attachment that became known as the core vent implant and the core vent attachment. And um, that had a lot to do with revolutionizing implant dentistry. The concept of an implant functioning freestanding uh, to stabilize the removable denture was uh, uh, foreign to everybody. They didn't think it would work. Uh, but um, I showed that it did and it became very successful and uh, then we moved on to other designs. In uh, 1986 I came up with the screw vent with the lead-in bevel internal hex connection which is now called the conical connection. The only difference between the screw vent which has a 45 degree lead-in bevel and Nobel's conical connection which has a 78 degree lead-in bevel or Astra's with a 79, uh, is that the steeper the bevel, the deeper the hex goes in the implant and the harder it is to feel whether your abutment is fully seated. So the standard connection, which is used by, uh, by Glidewell, by Zimmer, uh, by uh, BioHorizons, by Implant Direct, of course, and so many others around the world, the standard screw bed connection uh, I think is is still yet to be improved upon. So did you ever think back in the 70s and the 80s when um, basically um, only oral surgeons could do this, that that I believe it was uh, 2015 that in the United States more implants were placed by general dentists than specialists? Well, I take great pride in in possibly contributing to that because um, in 1984 or five, the Bronomark system uh, was launched in the United States and it was strictly oral surgeons. They, they eventually lowered their standards and let periodontists place them. Uh, but it was just oral surgeons and prosthodontists and you had to spend 1500 to take a course to uh, place the implants and to restore it. Uh, the Corvent system, um, was uh, much simpler. There was no restrictions on who could place it. Uh, in 1986, um, Dan Laskin, who was the editor of the Oral Surgery Journal at the time, came and took my two-day live surgical course. And there was a doctor in the audience uh, from Hawaii who had just spent $20,000 on the Bronomark system. And, and when he saw me do this surgery, he said, wow, I, I wish I had seen this before I spent 20 grand. And I said, you know, for 20,000, you could buy my system, a Volvo and a return flight to Gothenburg. And I turned to Dan Laskin, uh, Laskin and said, that would make a great ad. And he let me place an ad for six months in the journal where I said, there is a difference between the Bronomark system. And the difference is that you can get a Volvo and a trip to Gothenburg, Sweden for the same price when you buy our implant system. So what I also started was comparative, competitive advertising and marketing and tried to make people realize that this was really a lot simpler than uh, um, posted cores or pin ledges or any of the other sophisticated uh, things that we did in dentistry. Um, when I gave lectures, uh, which I did all over the world. Um, I remember one lecture I gave in New York in 1985, I had 200 registered and 150 walk-ins. Same thing happened in Hartford. When I would lecture, 
I wanted to make dentists feel comfortable that they could do it, general dentists. And I had plenty of surgeons that, that started with us and didn't want to uh, get involved with the Broadmark system at the time, the expense and whatnot. Uh, and I used to say to dentists, look, if you could drill a round hole with a drill that only cuts a round hole and screw in a self-tapping implant, you can place an implant. And if you screw up, move over, drill another hole, and now you're experienced. And I call that on the jaw training. And we would give two day courses, one day on surgery, one day on prosthetics, where I would lecture and place implants in plastic jaws. And let me tell you, some of the dentists left there uh, uh, and went on to build very successful implant practices. And some dentists just never had it. And no matter how many days of training, um, it, it would have been difficult for them. But when I, I first saw you lecture in 1987 and right out of the gate, I sit in the front row and I was listening to and I could just tell you were so passionate about every single detail. I mean, no matter what question anybody asked, you could tell you had thought about it for a hundred hours. I mean, there was, there was nothing ever asked to you. And anytime I saw you lecture, where you thought, well, I don't know, let me think about that. I mean, you just, my God, you, you could have gave a separate one hour lecture on every question asked. You just, you were so passionate about it. I had one question <laughs> that if you'll pardon my uh, French, I'll give you the answer. I had one dentist at the time, Bronemark believed you had to bury the implants. So therefore you could and wait to three months for them to heal. Uh, but if you were to extract the tooth and place an implant, you couldn't bury it. You couldn't bring the tissue over it. So I had one Bronemark surgeon uh, uh, was aghast with the fact that I was taking out teeth and putting in implants right away. And he says, why don't you wait, uh, uh, you know, and, and wait for everything to heal? So I said to him, well, look, if I were going to cut off your balls, would you want them cut off one at a time or both together? And uh, <laughs> that and, is and, awesome. And, and that, that gave the message and today, um, immediate placement and immediate load are a reality. I had a, one implant done on my front tooth after a root canal and a root fracture. My wife had the same thing, a root canal that failed with a post and core. Both of us had the implants placed, an abutment attached and temporization right away, walked out without a flipper, looked good. And the, the secret to be able to achieve that has a lot to do with the design of the implant and the surgical protocol. So my direction was always how to increase uh, success in soft bone as well as hard bone. I wrote an article that was published in the Canadian Dental Journal called, uh, called um, in, Achieving, uh, Increasing Success in Soft Bone. And, and the trick was what I did with the screw vent. I made it tapered but I didn't put it in with a tapered drill. Now, uh, Nobel sells the replace implant that has a tapered drill. When you have a tapered drill for a tapered implant, you need a different length drill for every implant, and you're not really adding to the stability of the implant. So I found that if I vary the surgical protocol with straight drills to put in tapered implants, I could titrate the amount of compression that I put on the bone to achieve high initial stability in soft bone and therefore allow immediate loading even in soft bone. Uh, that, that's a big controversy today. A lot of people are wondering, uh, should you surgical guide or should you not surgical guide? Well, I think it depends on the case. Um, uh, I think August uh, tries to do it with most every implant. That's what he feels comfortable with, and he's uh, very involved with a company that allows you to mill these guides right in the office. Um, I went, took him for lunch once, and I said, August, if you're going to teach for me, you've got to go old school. You can't scare everybody away that they need image-guided surgery to place an implant. My goodness, you got if it's a single lower molar, you can't go back of the second molar, you can't go forward to the first bicuspid and you split the buccolingual uh, width of the ridge and that's where your implant goes. You place a guide, uh, a pilot hole, put a guide pin in, take a periapical x-ray, you can see exactly where you are and how far you are from the mandibular canal and you put the implant in. This has got to be done easy, economical, 
and, and, and every general dentist, when they take out a tooth, they should be thinking about an implant. You also uh, said that, uh, you know, the PA, you can see where the mandibular canal is. Um, you've seen so many uh, changes in implants. I mean, it started out with subperiosteals and ramus frames and all over the board. But do you see the future trend of implants getting shorter and fatter so that you can be more safely away from the mandibular canal and potentially not have to do as many sinus lifts? No. Uh, we've got short, fat implants for those situations where uh, you have very little height and a lot of width. A dentist needs a full selection of diameters and widths. The um, uh, legacy implant system uh, sold by Implant Direct has seven diameters and, and seven lengths of implants. Um, so it's got a full range. Um, uh, I'm not a big fan of mini implants, um, uh, although I do make several um, three millimeter implants. Uh, but, but if you get much less than that, you, you end up with a tomato on a stick for the restoration. You end up with something that's weak. So you need to be able to do site preparation to accept an implant that can carry the load. Um, Carl Misch was a big proponent of over-engineering uh, his cases. Uh, he coined the expression, um, all on four, none on three. And the, the Bronomark system has promoted this all on four. Um, uh, but really, when you're doing surgery and a denseless jaw, how much, how difficult is it to put an extra implant in? So it shouldn't be an economical thing as to how many implants you put in. It should be what is going to uh, serve the patient the best, the longest. If you put in six implants and one fails or two fails, you still can build the case. In the early days, the Bronomark research was was very um, misleading. In other words, they, they were talking about uh, continuous function of bridges as the success criteria rather than implant individual implants. And if an implant failed, they would take it out and put another one in and then they would report on the continuous function of the bridges. But with the advent of core vent and a freestanding implant, with the advent of the screw vents internal connection, you could then do conventional prosthetics on implants. And let me explain why. When you're gonna attach an abutment to an implant and cement a restoration, which is my preference versus screw retained restorations, unless it's a full arch. So if you're gonna cement a restoration, the last thing you want is the abutment to come loose. And that's what the internal connection did, is it stabilized the connection so that uh, um, when there was lateral load, the force was on the abutment, not on the screw, and the screw didn't work loose, and therefore you could cement a restoration. Um, now there's controversy, cemented versus screw retained, and I'm a full believer in making implant dentistry like conventional dentistry, if general dentists are going to economically incorporate this into their practices? You know, quality is a good question. Um, companies that charge $400, $450 for an implant try and justify their price by claiming they have higher quality. Uh, but really today, all these implants are made on the same type of Japanese screw machines. Yeah, there are some Swiss machines, but they don't work as well. Uh, and the same machines that, uh, that somebody is making an implant in Brazil on is being used by the Strauman and Nobel in Switzerland. Um, the, the quality goes with, with the intent of the manufacturer. Now, companies that sell on discount alone, um, on price alone, are not overly concerned about quality because usually the dentists that are looking for the lowest possible price are not concerned about quality. But what Implant Direct was all about when I launched it in 2004 is that I could make an implant uh, as high or higher quality than any of the major companies. I could package it with all-in-one packaging so that you didn't have to buy all the ancillary components, a transfer, a healing collar, an abutment. Uh, you didn't have to think, well, what abutment goes with that implant? 
uh, and how do I order it? It was all there and by uh, using multifunctional components like the carrier was the transfer and was an apartment, I ended up saving up to 70% over the cost of, of uh, say Nobel or Strauman implants. And today, Implant Direct sells an implant called the Interactive, which is surgically and prosthetically compatible with Nobel Active. And uh, a dent, um, on the US list price, uh, there's over $600 difference when you add up the components. But here's my main gripe. Those major companies don't sell at that list price to oral surgeons. They sell a volume discounts to those dentists that are buying multiple implants uh, and they're getting 20, 30, 40% discount, whereas the poor GP who is buying implants case by case uh, is, is uh, carrying the uh, water for these specialists. Um, and uh, that's why when I started Implant Direct, there were no discounts. We said, this is everyday fair pricing, buy one, buy a thousand, there's no discount. L lots of bit different people have their reasons why implants fail. Some say the number one cause is peri-implantitis. Um, some say it's excess cement. If someone said to you, Jerry, what are the top three reasons why a dental implant would fail today? What would you say? Well, fail to achieve osseointegration. Say fail when? When you put the implant in and it fails in a month or two. That was a lack of initial stability. You didn't have an adequate volume of bone to place the implant. Maybe the labial plate was too thin and, and it dissolved away. So you need to have an adequate volume of bone and you need to achieve a high level of initial stability. That is built into the implant direct products because we have tapered implants with straight drills. And if the bone is soft, you stop at an intermediate drill. If the bone is dense, you go wider and we don't even make a bone tap. When you go into the bone tap to cut the threads and then screw the implant in, you've assured that that implant is gonna be relatively loose. Um, so initial failure, lack of initial stability, uh, uh, failure, maintenance issues. Um, uh, I've had cases come back loaded with plaque with no inf inflammation. Um, you don't have any periodontal ligament. These things are should not uh, uh, be susceptible to the normal things that periodontal disease uh, are. So this peri-implantitis, I think is a, uh, a misnomer. Uh, it, 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 yes, if you lose the bone, it creates an infrabony pocket that, and, and uh, it could continue to generate. But, uh, and maybe if you have a surface that is highly porous, like uh, Nobel's Tie Unite, or like the TPS of Strauman in the 90s, that will attract plaque. But the surfaces today that are done by blasting and etching um, are not porous, they're just textured and they help soft tissue even attach. Now, down the road failures are due mechanically uh, to some parts wearing or breaking or the case was under engineered. I, I took two and a half years of specialty training at USC and Indiana in prosthetics and then i started uh my um uh education i'll i'll tell you a short story when i was given the honorary doctorate at the university of manitoba which was my alma mater i had to lecture to the graduating class of uh, doctors and dentists and uh, pharmacists and i i advised them when you go into dental school at first year you have um unconscious incompetence. You don't know what you don't know. By second year, you have conscious incompetence. Now you know what you don't know. By third year, you have conscious competence. Now you can think about it and get it right, but hopefully by the time you graduate, you have unconscious competence. And then uh, about four years ago, I, I received another honor from the University of Manitoba Alumni of the Year. And I told that same story, but I told him at 71, I'm more concerned about unconscious incontinence. <laughs> so uh, the main I, thing is to be a, a lifelong student in, in this and, uh, and don't get hung up on, on uh, what the companies tell you. Uh, read for yourself, uh, list, take a lot of opinions, 
Um, a paid opinion leaders from companies get that position because they espouse the philosophy of the company. Um, I, uh, you know, have ruffled a lot of feathers in my day uh, because uh, I was counterculture to all of that. Um, and I, I take it as a point of pride that in the process, people came to realize that, uh, you know, that there's no magic. It isn't the magic titanium from uh, Russia that everybody thought the Nobel uh, implant had or, or, or uh, this patented surface or that patent. It's really the technique, the knowledge uh, of the dentist, uh, how much he cares about being a success and restoring that case properly. No different than doing conventional restorative dentistry. It's all critical to success. One, one thing I want to just say for the record is when I introduced Corvent in 1982, I really introduced implant prosthodontics as we know it today, because it was the only implant that had a hex hole that you could then cement in a variety of abutments depending on the case you were doing. So if you wanted a, a, a multi-unit bar, we had an abutment that took a screw. If you wanted a, a snap over denture, uh, we had that. If you want a custom cast abutment for an angle, we had that. And it, from there it evolved to making a variety of different abutments for screw retained restorations. And that is implant prosthodontics. Uh, um, I came up with application specific abutments and with implant direct, I came up with application specific implants. In other words, if you knew you were going to do an overdenture, then buy the go direct implant that had the snap overdenture attachment built into it or a multi-unit. Uh, if you were going to do a, uh, a single uh, tooth, then we had a, an abutment, uh, the transfer that could be cut off and be used as a snappy abutment. And we even made a one piece implant with an angled head. The point is application specific. Now, we may think we've come a long ways in implants, but what I had in the screw vent in 1986 with a, 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 a two-piece connection that stayed together, a screw implant with multiple threads, self-tapping, that's what we've got today. You, you can put bells and whistles on it. There's a, a marketing book called a Unique Selling Proposition. You want to create something different in your product and then spend all your marketing convincing people that that unique feature that only you have is the most important thing uh, uh, for, uh, for, for success. Uh, and so they all focus on being unique or having something different. More so, I call it innovation diarrhea. Uh, more so, they're developing things uh, uh, to create marketing stories rather than things that have real benefit. And that's never been what I'm about. Well, hey, thank you so much for all that you have done for dentistry. Uh, I mean, you are beyond amazing. I don't think I know anybody that has one patent, let alone 30 plus. Um, and it's so sweet of you to come on and spend an hour today with my homies. Again, thank you for all that you've done for dentistry. And thank you so much for coming on my show. Thank you, because I've always been a big fan of what you're doing and uh, very happy to uh, uh, connect with you this way.